Well, this is good. You're probably thinking, oh boy, Bob preaches. The youth group's probably saying, oh my goodness, they're letting Bob talk. <laughs> oh well, I like it. It's kind of fun. This is really a privilege. I, I appreciate um, Matt and uh, trusting in me and letting me take over here. I, I have preached before. Um, somewhat austere circumstances, actually. I preached two times in Iraq when we were there. And um, the, the, the chaplain that was with us, we became good friends. He was a kind of a Methodist sort of guy. And um, I typically call myself Baptist. But I'll, I'll, I'll move in and out of it if you need me to. But uh, he said, hey, listen, I, I want you to you know, take over one Sunday. And so I did, and, and I talked about our purpose in Christ and, and what that meant to all of us there in Iraq at the time because we were all frustrated. There wasn't really anybody to kill or shoot. Um, we were looking for weapons of mass destruction and never found them. Um, we just had a lot of people that were getting sick because of the heat and, and it was just frustrating. And, um, but we knew that there was a purpose and we went over that. The second time I preached um, was a couple of weeks later uh, because the chaplain was out um, closer to the Iranian border with our other group of people. So he said, will you handle here? I said, okay. So we were preaching, and I was actually preaching on Romans 5, verse 12, and I was just sticking with one, one verse because they said, uh, Doc, you actually talked way too long the first time, so can you make it shorter this next time? Said, okay, fine. Well, God had his hand in that one because we got... Um, we had a, like an attack while we were in the middle of our church service, and so I think I only talked for like 10 minutes. And so, you know, here we are now. I'm hoping that there's not a missile attack, but we'll just um, see what happens. I I'm a pretty transparent guy. I am going to make it this short and sweet. Um, as I practiced through this talk, though, earlier, I, it was like 20 minutes, and I hadn't even gotten through the introduction, so I said, mm okay, let's figure this out. But um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can keep this to, what, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but being transparent, I am going to be pretty honest today with myself and you. And it's only to prove a point, and we'll get to that. But um, I want you to know that I'm also very passionate. Those things of which I am passionate about, um, I basically get very passionate. So I think you'll, you'll see that as we go into... Um, our next slide here. Did it happen? Good. I know you can't read this, but if, you're, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And you won't get lost today because we're either going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1 or 2 Peter chapter 1. So I tried to make that easy for you. I had about 30 other scriptural references that I was going to throw at you, but I figured, eh, we're not here for Bible drill, so I'm going to cut it down a little bit. Before we get to this, though, I want to remind you of a very important verse, and that's John 3.16, which most of us probably don't need the scriptural reference up there on a PowerPoint slide. But let's just go through that in our, in our heads or speak it out or whatever you need. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, or His only begotten Son, that whomever believes in Him will have eternal life. Right? So it's for everyone. So let's remember that we're talking as a community this morning, a congregation, people brought together, and we're looking at where we are, but I want you also to realize that God's love is for the person on your left, right, front, back, everybody in here, okay? It's talking about Christ in us, but we're also talking about them. So we're also looking outside of Journey Church, outside of this community, into the greater community, as far as how that impacts people around us. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, Four through seven? Okay, yeah, First Peter chapter 1, verses 3. That's wrong. I don't know who did that. So First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Now I know why y'all were mumbling while I was saying First Peter chapter 1. Okay, never mind. All praise to God. This is out of the New Living Translation, by the way. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is by His great mercy that we have been born again. 
Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we live with great expectation or hope. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled. Some translations say incorruptible. And we have a pri uh, well, sorry, um, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Now, there's a lot of places that talk about the mystery of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, how it is to be a Christian and a believer and what happens. There are many places, but this one right here, just, it makes my dress spin. Because it's talking about Christ in us. It's talking about eternal life. It mentions our faith, and it mentions our journey in this life in regard to our faith and what happens to us. It talks about how our journey and those things that happen to us sort of guide where we go and guide how we respond. Those trials, if you look at the last part of this thing, those trials are there to strengthen us and make our faith more secure and make ourselves more secure in our faith so that we can keep moving on. Because why? Because we have a responsibility to be involved in kingdom business. Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And if you skip the first pages and go to the first chapter, the first sentence is, what, does anybody know? Exactly right. It's not about you. We were talking about this in our, um, our group study time this morning. Nate said it perfectly in that he gave us an analogy of, we think that there's this movie here that we are the star of and every day people are getting out and watching this movie and just to see Bob and I'm thinking that everybody's watching this movie because they want to see the movie of me and so every day I'm getting up and I'm probably taking this a little bit out of context from Nate but you know I'm trying to make a point okay so I'm thinking that every day I'm getting up and everybody's watching this movie of me the funny thing is is y'all are getting up every day and watching that movie of you. And we forget that the movie really isn't about us. We may have some sort of a cameo appearance or we may be stuck in the crowd behind what the main scene is doing, but it's not about us. And every day is not about that movie that plays with us starring the role, or in the starring role. So it's about what? It's about community. It's about kingdom business. It's about walking through the day in our faith, affecting those around us. Let me see where I'm at. What I want to review is the concept of our ministry here at Journey. And I want to look at that ministry in each of our lives. And I want to engage in the process of looking at at where we are and how we can better address what we're doing in regard to the kingdom. We can get to a place where we can say, oh, man, thank goodness we're in this new building, we've got that daycare thing squared away, and things are moving, and we don't have any more of that uncomfortable feeling between what was Eastview and what is Journey, and it seems like we're able to, you know, figure out how to put all the chairs out every day, and, 
And, okay, yeah, we need help with Wednesday night and something like that, but, boy, everything's so much better. Let's just relax a little bit. We've got the various ministries that are going on, and I'm telling you, if you look at what Journey Church is doing right now in comparison to other churches of our size, I think you would be amazed at how we are excelling in kingdom business. But can we do that better? Are we purposely working each day we get up, every one of us, and are we looking at what am I going to do today for God? Or are we purposely getting up and saying, okay, I've um, got to do breakfast, got to get the kids up, got to get the, that stuff. I mean, yeah, you got to do that, but really where are we in working with our faith, walking in our faith, and purposefully being involved in kingdom business? Just a question. With the next slide, I kind of want to go through some things that um, are basically going to review where we at in our where we're at in our culture. Life in a fallen world is kind of where we seem to be. I mean, every day we look at the nasty things on the news, and we look at what's happening in that town and this town and that country and and we just sort of get this thing of well thank goodness it's not right here at home or we say say a prayer for those people who are going through those things but this world really complicates our lives as a believer because we are we we believe in Jesus Christ God's son that he died on the cross for us and that he is here to take away our sins and therefore take us away from that promise of death but yet give us a promise of life just like we talked about in first Peter chapter 1 but our calling is challenged and our spiritual gifts that are given to us are at risk for being hidden not and, and not used because we either have fear in being what Christ wants us to be because we don't want to walk up to that friend at school and say hey how you doing listen I was really concerned about you last week so I prayed about you because I knew you, you had the flu and so you know I just wanted to let you know that but sometimes we feel that it's safer or more acceptable or, or more neutral to follow the crowd or, yeah, boy, you know, I don't want to really push this right now because there's five of them and one of me and we're at the lunch table. Well, we only have 10 minutes and, boy, I'm really busy, so I really don't want to respond to that person who just said they don't believe in Christ. Or we do the other thing that is really bugging me these days. And that is um, we hide behind something that's politically correct. All of a sudden, we're supposed to have these social cues in what we do every day. And if you hear the word homosexual, you're supposed to act like you agree. And, and if you talk about marriage for homosexuals, you're supposed to like say, okay, that's just a part of our culture. I'm not really going to push that issue. Or we're, we're talking about people that have... Talking about people that have problems and, and they're, they're stealing and they're saying horrible things and they're, they're doing horrible things, but yet we revere them as an icon in our society just because they play football so well. We know that we are overspending, that we, our budget is not even a budget, and we are just going crazy on things like football games and football tickets and... and getting all sorts of things for our kids because they deserve it, but yet we can't pay our bills. And so we're not using our resources wisely to the point that we can't even tithe or, or, or perform good stewardship for the church that we go to and expect so much out of. So it's all whacked up. So life in this fallen world is difficult. These are those trials that 1 Peter 1 was talking about. This is that stuff that we have to go through every day. It's, 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 it's there for each of us. We think, hmm, what are we going to do? Are we too complacent? Maybe. I realize that this doesn't apply to everybody here, possibly. But I'm talking about those of us who barely get by you may hide the bad stuff and come to church and go through the daily grind trying to make everybody feel as though that you're all together and you've got it, you've, everything's perfect and I don't have any problems at all. 
Your whole desire is to make people think you're a shining light in the crowd because you run such a tight ship when it comes to life and all that goes on. I'm concerned that some Christians have checked, have, have checked in and put that little box in there, yep, I believe in Jesus Christ, but the faith box, they're sort of waiting to check on that because they're not really sure that they want to participate. And then there are some people who say they're, they are a Christian, and as a Christian, you can tell that they are no more Christian than Darth Vader is Yoda's mama. <laughs> right? And you know that what they're talking and what they're throwing out there is just bogus. So how do you respond? Do you confront them? Well, it would probably be a little politically incorrect to call them a liar. So I probably can't really say it that way. I just want each of us to examine today and evaluate where we are because there is too much at stake. There are people out there who need Jesus. And what does that mean? It is what we just read. God, in His infinite and insurmountable mercy, granted us life through Jesus Christ who died to make it all possible. And we have the assurance that there is a completely incorruptible in inheritance in heaven because we have believed and we continue to work out our faith for the glory of God so that we might be honored with Him once we die. It's eternal salvation and a promise of eternal life. That's the real gospel. And that's the real answer to what is going on in society today. So I'm just pitching out a little sales thing here. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this is the day that we can get that squared away. If you don't know where we're going in regard to this, Jesus Christ died for my sins, the sins are the things that I have done wrong that are against God, and I have the opportunity to get rid of all of that and from that gain salvation become saved and know that I will have eternal life once I am believing in God and following Him if you don't get that whole process hang on for a minute but for the rest of you let's kinda keep moving as where we're gonna go next slide did you know that in the United States, first marriages have a 50% chance of making it. And when we talk about child abuse, one out of 10 children witness family violence. One in 10 are maltreated, and one in 16 are sexually abused. So that means that if we take our little kids who are in children's church, five years old and below, and we line 16 of them up, one of them, by our statistics, will have been sexually abused. Take 10 of them, one of them will have witnessed some sort of family violence, domestic violence, some sort of nasty, maltreated thing that could happen. We think that's nasty. I don't know. Somebody may think it's cool. 25% of those kids that are less than three years old have been victims of abuse. 45% are less than five. These are our babies. No one can protect them but us. But did you know that in child abuse cases, 80% of the perpetrators are a parent? Those that have died in relation to abuse, 70% of them are less than three, and 44% are less than one. Next slide, please. Homeless people. We don't really talk about them. We try to ignore them. 610,000 people in 2013 were homeless on any given night. 65% of those people were in emergency shelters or transitional housing programs. Thank goodness for those places. 35% were unsheltered at all. Laying on the streets. You see this a lot in big cities. Everybody been to a big city and walking behind them. Do you just walk by and ignore them and try not to look? Oh, blinders on. 10% of those that are homeless, I jumped one, 23% of all the people that are homeless are less than 18. 10% are 18 to 24, 67% are over 25, and 26% of them manifest severe mental illness. Let's talk about human trafficking. Boy, when do we start hearing about that? All of a sudden it's on the news right up there with let's put a fence around our yard. 
In 2007, the international data ranged anywhere from 4 to 27 million. I didn't put it into one number because I found all sorts of different sources, so I thought I would just range it. 4 to 27 million persons internationally. Did you know that 12 to 14 years of age is still the age where these kids will enter into prostitution? 50% of those brought into trafficking are children, with 80% of those being women or girls. The commercial sex industry accounts for greater than 800,000 people crossing our border every year. And I think they're still not for sure of that number because, of course, the whole thing keeps going and it's secretive and, you know, I don't know. They're putting people in tire trucks and all that sort of thing. There's 161 countries affected, so it's not just the United States. I don't even know how many countries there are in the world right now. You high school people with geology or sociology, do you know? There's a lot, I guess. 196 officially, so 161 is like more than 80%, maybe. Thanks for that, though. So, here's the thing. Trafficking in the United States for the year of 2013, I think I said 2013, maybe I didn't, $32 billion in profits. That's how much we spend on over-the-counter diet supplements. Next slide. Mental illness. One in four persons suffer from serious mental illness, schizophrenia, major depression, bipolar disorder. Oh, I'm sorry. One in four have a mental illness. One in 17 show serious disease. Okay, so let's look at that again. All of us in this room count off one, two, three, four, five, six. One in 17 of us have serious mental disease. Anybody agree? Well, of course not. You're at church. You're not supposed to fess up to that stuff. 18% of adults live with an anxiety disorder such as panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, general an generalized anxiety disorder, or obsessive compulsive disorder. 70% of juvenile youth, or well, that's saying the same thing, 70% of youth in a juvenile judicial system have a mental illness. Nate, would you agree? <clears throat> Military and veterans. Kick this one up, would you? They are less than 1% of our population, but they make up of 20% of suicides nationally. These are our veterans. 22 suicides per day amongst ver veterans. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S., and it's third, third, among those ages 15 to 24. Okay. Next slide, please. I'm almost done. I just wanted to show you how hard it is to live in this world, and I, I looked at single parents. In 2011, there were 13 million points, or 13.7 million single parents raising 22 million children. 26% of those children are less than 21. Among single mothers, I always thought that single mothers were so busy taking care of their kids that they didn't have time to work. But over three-fourths of them actually have jobs, and over half of them are doing full-time jobs while taking care of these kids on their own. I mean, that slaps me in the face. Look how hard these people are working. 80, uh, um, um, 85% of single fathers have a job. I guess it's easier for a guy to get a job. I don't know, but what does he do with his kids? 14% of the U.S. population in 2009 lived in poverty. Who knows what that is now? I, I didn't really get that updated stuff. But if you figure that poverty level is $23,850 a year for a family of four, that anything that and below is poverty. Extreme poverty is even less obviously, but it, equi it, it, equivalates, it, it equilibrates to $2 a day. In 2012, the poverty level was still rising to 16%. Next slide. Illiteracy. I think this is my last one. In 2013, 14% of the population in the United States, which equals 32 million people, were illiterate, meaning they couldn't read or write or couldn't read or just could write or probably all of it. 
21% of adults are only able to read to the fifth grade level or below. 19% of high school graduates can't read. So we've got 32 million people in our world, in our nation, that need to be getting out and, and doing meaningful things and being productive in society. Am I saying they can't be productive? No. I'm just saying that most of us would say this is pretty much an atrocity because if we are one of the biggest nations and the most advanced in the world and we've got 20% of our kids graduating high school that can't even read, how are they actually graduating? So what's up with that? So these are the trials that we face. This is the stuff that's in our world every day. If you're a part of it, I'm just thankful that we've got Journey Church to, to have you be here with us. Because we're a community and we're going to take care of our people. And we're going to support each other. And we're going to reach out to each other. And we're going to get past that, it's, a, it's not about me, and this isn't my, my featured home video about me, we're going to be looking at you. Next slide. I'm going to try to speed up. We're going to leave that there. Everyone's got a story. I started saying this about 2009, didn't I, Leanne? Everybody's got a story. Our journey in this life brings events and circumstances. We're all affected. And I know because I'm a physician and I talk to people every day that have hurts and aches and pains and desires and fears. They have events in their life that they have still not gotten over and that was 30 years ago. We've got things that people do not know how to look at, they do not know how to deal with, and they have no one to sit down and listen. Much less pray for them. And you folks who meet weekly in this church and you pray, you know that the prayer request that you get in the box out there and the stuff that you're going to be able to pray for, you know that it doesn't even touch what really needs to be prayed for in our community, do you? And if everyone looks around at what's going on in their lives and the people that they see and the people that they engage in, you know that your ability to talk to them about Jesus Christ, I haven't really gotten there yet. Because I know that I do that, and if I do that, I know that you do that. Because I think that statistically and from a probability standpoint, you would think that we're pretty much all average here, and that we pretty much all do the same things throughout the day. That's the only reason I'm saying that. If you're above that, good. Get with me and tell me what I'm supposed to do. Myself as a teen, I think that all of the temptations that a teenager would typically have, I probably came against. I, I don't think I was a bad kid. I mean, I didn't end up in detention or... Ju well, I was in detention in seventh grade. Um, I wasn't in, like, you know, bad detention, you know, like, in trouble with the law type stuff. I became a Christian at eight years old, and at the time we were in the Christian church, and with the Christian church, it's pretty much, you know, here's heaven and here's hell, Jesus can help you get to heaven, and all you got to do is be baptized. And so at eight years old, the only thing I remember about baptism is it was freezing cold. And I think it like turned off my brain or something because after that, I, I just don't really remember. My family always went to church and I was always in the youth group. And um, I can recall that in, in, in what we did, though, there was this pervasive element that it's all fun and, fun and games until someone mentions living for Jesus. And I remember that in our youth group and I remember trying to trying to make it to where, I, I mean, I wanted a little bit more depth and I wanted to dig in a little bit more, but I didn't say anything because everybody else kind of wanted to, do, you know, do this typical youth group thing, and so I just went into the typical youth group thing. When I graduated from high school, I, I, I felt, you know, I'm a Christian, but boy, I think back on eight years old and all I can remember is it was really cold water. And so, um, and I've told the kids this story before. I said one day, I said, you know what? I'm going to make this right because Satan is using this against me. And so I went down the aisle one day and I said, I'm tired of feeling as though I'm a fake and then I'm just getting through this. And I am going to pray that prayer. I am going to do what needs to happen. And I'm doing it because I'm going to remember it. And I'm doing it with the heart and I understand where I'm at. Satan was never able to use it after that. 
but I know that I'm a Christian. But at that time, I was somewhat perplexed because I was working with Campus Crusade for Christ and with three of my best friends, and, and it was going well, but the kids were only there for the fun and the, and the, the games, and, and whenever it would start getting serious, it was like whenever I was in youth group. You mention living for Jesus, and they're all of a sudden, oh, they get shifty and restless, and oh, when are we going to play skeet ball? And I sort of got burned out. So I said, well, all right. I'm 20 years old. Maybe I'll grow up. I was in nursing school. I got a real job. I mean, not that Campus for Christ, Campus Crusade for Christ is not a real job. By the way, Matt said that anything you guys don't like today that I say, it's because he told me to say it, so it's all right here in the script. Deacon of the Week. That's complain to them. Uh, finding my place and getting married became a lot more responsibility. Being a nurse, especially in the ICU or the emergency room, you see a lot of death, you see a lot of trauma. My, my wife tells the joke that we were giving heavy duty narcotics and paralyzing people on breathing machines um, in the ICU and the ER before we could legally drink alcohol. I find that funny. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Honey, that's a lame joke. I decided that I wanted more out of medicine, and so I thought that would be going to medical school. Boy, was I wrong. But with medical school and getting into medicine, though, I, you know, I deal with this continuum that we are on, um, from health to illness to death. I deal with that every day. And I talk with people at some point in that continuum every day. My job right now is more on the continuum of those who are closer to death than the rest of us. I remember though getting into medical practice and initially it was in the army because they paid for me to go to medical school and so therefore I had to pay them some time back, hence the wonderful desert resorts that I got to go to. But I remember being in Colorado, beautiful place to live, but it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. I mean, there was just no camaraderie. It was just, it was horrible. And it was just, it was so taxing to practice there. <clears throat> so at one point I decided, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. And Leanne said, okay, let's go out and do your own thing. And we thought we had the right partners um, to go into business with. Well, we soon found out, Leanne before me, that it wasn't the right thing. So we pretty much gave up everything and lost everything in that venture. So after going through bankruptcy, through that process, God showed us, you know, guys, I'm trying to tell you, it's not about you. It's about those people around you. It's about those people that you encounter and you engage with every day that have a story. And I want you to listen to their stories. That was it, right, honey? And we, we soon realized that money, house, car, all that kind of stuff, no. We can get away from it. But I'm telling you, the transparent guy that I told you I was going through, and I'm telling you right now so that you'll know that it's here and it's in the midst of our community, I had to battle by myself because I was too proud to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist because I didn't want anybody to say, oh, you're an impaired provider, you can't practice medicine, because I needed to continue practicing medicine. But I did it by myself, getting through suicide and the feelings of suicide and having the plans and having it all written down. I knew exactly what I needed to do. I also had it planned on how to kill those business partners. I knew exactly where to go. I knew exactly where to drive. I knew exactly what time of day to do it. And for a year and a half, I had to battle by myself because I was too proud to get help in order to avoid killing myself or killing somebody else. Because I was in the army, I knew how to kill, I saw how people killed, I wanted to do the same thing because those people wrecked my life. I still don't know how close I came to losing Leanne and Tori. But it was pretty close. lose everything. 
It's in our community. How many people are going through bankruptcy right now? There are over, there are over 20 million cases every year. And in 2014, it's supposed to be even more. We don't know yet because nobody, I don't, everybody's not filed their taxes yet. Child abuse. Murder. Rape. Everything. It's there. Okay. You're really depressing, Bob. 2 Peter 1. Verse 3. I told you, it's 1 Peter 1, 2 Peter 1. All that on one slide, I apologize for that. Totally messed up the process. We're going to be done here in a little bit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him. What did we do? We believed the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Who did it? Him. It's not about us. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. I will give you eternal life. I will give you eternal salvation. I will be with you wherever you go, no matter what. I will never leave you. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. All that stuff we talked about, all those things that may have been relevant to you, all of that stuff that you're thinking, oh my goodness, is he looking at me when he just said that? All of that stuff we just went through, that is not yours. That is not yours yours. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement. The Amplified Version says exercise. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence or virtue. And with moral excellence, knowledge. Meaning, exercising moral excellence, develop knowledge. In knowledge, develop self-control. Exercising self-control, develop patient endurance. With patient endurance, develop godliness. Godliness, brotherly love, and brotherly affection with love for everyone. Everyone. This is not about us, it's about them. It's about those of us that we know, yes. But whenever you talk about the I, make sure that you follow it with the them. Because that's what we're here for. We are not here for I, or me, or you, or myself. We are here for them. And as a church, I think that that should be our goal in being involved in kingdom business. Let me go on. The more you grow like this, like what he was talking about in verse 7, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you are really are among those God has called and chosen. This is coming straight from the Bible. I'm not making this up. Do these things and you will never fall away. So the converse is, don't do these things, you're going to be lukewarm and God's going to spit you out of His mouth. He doesn't want half-hearted. He doesn't want sort of, sort of when it's convenient. God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal, eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't have a relationship with Him, if you don't understand where all that's going, we've got people here that can explain it. So, here in a little bit, we're all going to be doing some things. You can just make your way right down here, 
grab one of the important people or what who looks like an important people. Don't come to me because that well, never mind. But do it. Talk about it today. Even if you decide not to say yes to Jesus, you can at least consider it. That's okay. For the rest of us, this is our first time to practice this is not about you, but it's about somebody else. So I want you to be open and honest and as transparent as you can be, like I tried to be. And I want you to get with somebody. This invitation time is for everyone. Praise team, if you guys think that this is for you, you just stop doing the praise team thing and go somewhere. If this is husband and wife and you guys need to get together and pray today, you better do it today. If this is aunt and uncle, if this is kids in the youth group and you need to tell somebody something, this is it right now. Because we're a community and we're going to take care of each other and this is where it starts. So if you are a believer today, I want you to grab somebody and I want you to pray, Holy Spirit, guide me with whoever I come in contact with. And whenever you come in contact with, I guarantee you, the Holy Spirit is going to pow! He's going to give it to you and you are going to be able to pray with that person and reach out in love and you're going to hold them and support them and build them up. That's what I challenge you to do during this time of invitation. So, Matt, Matt, Chip, whoever comes up here. We've got the altar. We've got chairs. We've got tables. If you need a room, go find a room. But I want you to pray. And I want you to encounter somebody today. If you don't want to move, because it hurts too much to move, sit there and I want you to grab somebody's hand and I want you to start praying for them. Because this is where it starts. This is our community. It's kingdom business. And we're going to be involved in kingdom business.